So, how you guys doing? Good, good, good. Um, if you happen to not know me, I'm Joel, I'm one of the elders here. Uh, we are going to be jumping into uh, Acts chapter 5 tonight, uh, continuing on with the teaching that the elders have been doing. Um, Pastor Jim finished up Acts 4 last week. And uh, I'm going to start off tonight actually uh, jumping in straight in and re- reading through the section we're going to read. We're going to be in Acts uh, chapter 5, 1 through 16. So you grab your Bibles. Go ahead and turn there, read with me. Um, announcements for this week. Uh, there's a Passover this Friday. Uh, I believe tonight is the last night to get your tickets in the, in the cafe. $20 for adults, so that'd be all of us. $5 for kids. Go, go to your life group uh, leader and, or, or find a life group leader and, and they'll cook it here. Take it there, and you'll celebrate as a as a uh, family Passover type of scenario. Um, or there's the life group option, the open life group options here at 6:30 on Friday. Um, I believe that's it for it for uh, announcements. All right, let's jump in. Acts chapter five, verse one through sixteen. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord. Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young man came in and found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all in one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on the beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Let's pray. Father, uh, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, God, for this this event, Lord, that you allowed to take place in the early church, that you recorded in your scriptures, Lord, for us to, um, to grow from, to draw near you from. God, I pray, Lord, as we dig in, Lord, that your spirit will lead us, your spirit will guide us, and God, that we will rightly divide uh, your word tonight. God, we thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus. Uh, We thank you, Lord, for the grace that you've given us through him. When we ask you, Lord, to bless this night. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. So the thought here that's continued in the first part of Acts is started, or the first part of Acts 5 is started in Acts 4.32. Um, and so that'll become, it's important anyway to have the context, but it'll become important later on. And, and I want to throw out, I had a whole chunk that I was going to throw out about uh, communism. Didn't want to get in, didn't want to waste the time on that necessarily. But I do want to say this, this tends to be a proof text that those believers who want to push socialism and communism go to and say, look, look what they did. They all 
gave all their money together and they all lived happily ever after and they all, and it's not that. You, you, you gotta dig a little deeper to, uh, to realize that that's not at all uh, what, what is going on here. Uh, at no point does, does Peter even say, hey, this was a good thing they were doing. It wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Later on, you find the Jerusalem church is absolutely broke, and other, other churches are having to support them. So I'm not going to go any further than that just to say that this is absolutely not a, not a proof text that you can pull socialism or communism and, and say, hey, look, the Bible says. Um, but going on, so that we're going to jump back to 32 just for a second. If I get in the right chapter, chapter 4, 32, now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. And so when we start off five, it starts off with but, and that's a but based on that now. So you have the now, nor, and, and, but. And this is a, so the thing that jumps out at us are right, right here that, that um, I didn't get honestly, until I started digging into the, I didn't realize this, but that Ananias and Sapphira are, are part of this believers. That changes the whole picture we have of this scripture. They are believers. And uh, surprisingly, believers sin. <laughs> we, who knew believers sin? <laughs> and so uh, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually start off with a life lesson. This is a strange place to start, but I'll start there. Um, Certain sections of Scripture are descriptive and not directly prescriptive. When the Bible records events, it does not necessarily say, do this or don't do that. So the Bible has many, many points in where it is a, a historical narrative. It's telling the story. It's recording the story. And, and what happened is true. What happened happened and is true. But it, we're not necessarily supposed to pick that out of the pages and then let me go apply this to my life. If I, if I lie, God's going to kill me. Or, or in the case of, you know, you, if, you, if you take the historical narrative of Job out and, and, and you, um, you know, his wife, you know, he was having a rough time. His wife said, curse God and die. Hey, it says it right there in the Bible. Wives should tell their husbands if they're sick, curse God and die. I mean, so it's, we, need to, we need to be careful uh, with it, well, always couching the study of Scripture in, in the context of the Scripture. What kind, what kind of uh, writing is it? Um, so, what about First uh, Timothy? Excuse me, First Timothy three, sixteen through seventeen. Actually, that's second. Second Timothy. Sorry about that. Second Timothy. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Every bit of scripture, including this one, every bit of historical narrative, this is true for. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that a man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. But, but some of it takes some work. You can't just take the surface and say, oh, I apply this simple thing to my life. So, again, absolutely true not saying this trip, scripture is not true. However, it's important to understand that, that the Bible is not a, a single faceted or single layer book. There are many facets, many layers. Think about the fact simply watching a movie and then watching it a second time, how much more you pick up that second time and the third time and you pick up more and think that the Bible is all scripture is given by inspiration of God. He wrote this thing. He wrote the Bible. How much better of a director of a story, of a narrative, is he, how many more layers can he put in there than, than the greatest director we have to direct a movie? So the first pass through, you may get a bit. You think, um, you know, a, ba a babe in Christ can pick up a, a portion of Scripture, and they can read it, and they can be fed, and they can learn something simple from it. But somebody who's been studying the Word all their life can pick up that same passage that they've been reading over and over and over, and then the Lord takes them to a new level of understanding, takes them to a new uh, revelation, not, not different or separate from the other layers, but a deeper understanding. Um, so 
So and why I start, start here is because at first glance over this section, it's kind of a, really? <laughs> it's, it's kind of a weird story if you think about it. It's, it's you know, the, these guys gave of something of their own and they came and brought it to them. Yeah, yes, they lied. I get all that, but nobody forced them to give it. And they, they still were generous. And then all of a sudden, whack, you're done, right? And this is, so this is at, at first glance, this is, this is a difficult story to, 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 to chew on with the God of love, a God of mercy, a God of grace. However, and, that, and this, this is just life lesson here, that if, if you come to a, if you're reading something in Scripture and it doesn't make sense to, you, sense to you, excuse me, let me try this over. If something does not make sense to you when you read and study the Bible, something is not wrong with the Bible. I mean, that's, that's self-explanatory. It's not, the Bible's not wrong here. It's, you have a heart issue. You have an under, understanding issue. You just need to grow in maturity. There's, there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's been many times where I, I come across a bit of Scripture and I'm, I, I don't understand. This does not make, you know, doesn't make any sense to me how I fit this in. So I pray about it. Oftentimes I'll write it down. I'll write down my question. I, I've been amazed how many times when I've taken the effort to write down my question, how when I'm, when I'm chewing on that question, I'll get an answer off the radio. I'll get an answer. I happen to be reading later that week. And I, the Lord will answer these questions that we have. He'll, he'll, he'll give us illumination of, of Scripture that we don't understand. But, but don't get stuck on it. Well, I don't understand. This just doesn't make sense. Read it. Pray. Move on. To, to, what, to another passage that the, uh, the Lord might illuminate for you. 2 Timothy 2.15 Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Diligence by definition takes time. Diligence by definition takes time. We, we must continue to study and dig and, and get in deeper in order to understand some things. So all that said, just kind of a preface because this is kind of a weird story. So let's dig in. But, remembering this is coming from now the multitude of those who believed, but a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and they kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. So what are some things that we observe right off the bat? He sold a possession. If you look back up at what the other folks were there selling, all their possessions. So he sold a possession. And, in, and on top of that, he kept back part of the proceeds. And on and he only set aside a certain part to bring in and set at the apostles' feet. His wife was aware of it. We're, we're given that bit. Um, an interesting thing here is Satan filled and yet he conceived in his heart. These are not opposing things. The devil didn't make you do it. Satan may have given you temptation. We may have a temptation and a, and, a, and a stronghold maybe even that we trip on, but Satan didn't make you do it. He planted a temptation, and we conceived in our heart to walk that temptation out. And he lied to the Holy Spirit. He lied to God, and he lied to the Holy Spirit. This, this happens to be one of the proof texts for uh, the Holy Spirit being God, being uh, one of the Trinity um, that here it first says, uh, filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit, drop down and said, you have not lied to men, but to God. Uh, saying that the Holy Spirit is God. Something we agree with, but it's a, it's a proof text uh, for that point. So, take a, take a step back to what's going on in the story. They, they've been meeting at Solomon's porch. And if you have a view of, of the... Anybody been to Israel here? Israel. So you, that 
Right now, we basically have one, one wall left. The, the temple complex was a huge, huge structure. Um, and Solomon's porch was a, on the east side of the wall. It was a large colonnade. It's called Solomon's porch, Solomon's portico, Solomon's colonnade, many different things. It was basically a, a covered porch, for lack of a better term. It had three columns covered where people could gather in. Uh, it was outside of the, um, it, was, it was just to the front of the women's court. Uh, around, around the uh, outside was the um, court of the Gentiles. and it was kind of, I don't know if it was part of it, but it was kind of the front area that anybody could go into. Um, and so you have this massive structure, massive structure that people are, are gathering in a public place and they're gathering, preaching the gospel. They're gathering as, as, as a body of believers coming together and fellowshipping in a public place. And so Ananias and Sapphira, who are part of these believers, are watching what's going on. And they're watching these people coming up who've sold all, all that they have to bring forth this gift of sacrifice to lay at the apostles' feet, to lay at Peter's feet. And they see the honor that's, that's given to these people. They see the man, that's pretty cool to do something like that. That's pretty neat to, to see people do something like that. Barnabas being one of them we see here, who is raised up as a, as a friend and a traveler of the apostles. And, and uh, so, so, they, so they, they're in a public place. They're able to um, see the result of a gift of sacrificial giving that the Lord has given to some people. And so I think this, this bears a, a warning for us in that they saw what was happening and they wanted some of the result of what was happening without going through the pain and the sacrifice of getting what was happening. They, they saw this, this little picture, this little circumstance in somebody's life rather than the, the full scope of their whole life. And they said, I want that. And that looks nice. I'd like to have that. And how often do... We do that. We, we see somebody, he's got a cool spiritual gift. He, man, that guy can teach. He's got a cool spiritual gift. Man, that guy, he's got a great voice. I want that. Why can't I sing, God? Man, it, I can't sing for anything. So that God did not give me that. But, but we, how often do we look somewhere else at somebody else's gift? They have a nice house, a nice car, uh, a nice wife, no wife, whatever. We, we look somewhere else and say, I want that, God. Right? I want, I want what they got instead of what I got. And we look at one little circumstance of what they have rather than the whole picture that goes with what they have. And we would like to, oh, I'd like to have the big house and the big car. Oh, and this person's daddy who financed it all. And I don't want any of the bad parts of everybody's life. I just want the good parts. And it's easy to look around and see the best and the honorable and the happy parts of people's lives, and then look at your life. Oh, nothing's good in my life, you know. Rather than uh, be thankful and joyful with the life that God has given us, and not not seek to be exalted um, outside of humility. First Peter five six through seven. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you. In due time, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. He, he didn't forget about you. He didn't forget about me. He didn't think he had handed out gifts and he gave him nice gifts and him nice gifts and him money and me. But what about me, God? He didn't forget about me. He, he blessed me. He cares for me. He blessed me with the best gifts for me. And we have no idea what, what spiritual gifts that that God was going to give Ananias and Sapphira. Seems they gave, he gave them wealth. But, we're, but we can, without stretching too far, we can pretty much say he did not give them the gift of sacrificial giving at that point. He, they, they couldn't walk in a gift they didn't have at that point, right? For example, in my own life, with, uh, I, I, can, I can look at uh, Pastor Tom now, and I can become very frustrated because Tom is very rigid and scheduled and has things everything down to a T, and that's just not who I am. I can look at Tom and say, man, I would really like to be like that. 
but I'm not. That's just not who I, God gave me different gifts. And so I, I can, I can work towards that and I can, and the Lord can grow me in that, but it's not a natural gift administration that God has given me. And so I can either be, I can either be happy and thankful of the gifts that God gave me and praise the Lord and walk in those gifts, or I can continue to look at Tom and man, I wish I had that gift. I wish I could do that, right? It's a life lesson here. God has called you to be you. Faithfully and with thanksgiving, walk in the gifts He has given you. You are uniquely and wonderfully made in His image to, to, to reveal an aspect of who He is to the world. And if you're trying to look like me, or if I'm trying to look like Carson, I'm going I'm to be an ugly picture of Carson. And so I need to be who God has created me to be in him and walk in the gifts that he's created me to have and, and use those gifts rather than try to, you know, but, but these gifts, look, people really like those gifts and they, they give honor to people with those gifts. Walk in humility and in the, in the, in thankfulness and what God has given you to walk in. Verse 5, then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. If you'll allow me a bit of conjecture... I think based on this, this scripture alone, we know that they don't have Facebook. I really think that we can, three hours her husband was dead and she didn't know. They didn't have texting. I mean, we, this is proof text to that. But um, there's, quite, there's a lot of questions. Why, why is she coming? Why, why is she coming? Was she looking for her husband? Did everybody, uh-oh, here comes the fire. You saw what happened to Ananias. We, we don't know what, not given the details of what's going on. We just know she's walking up and nobody's saying anything. She doesn't know anything about it. She's probably ca catching weird looks. Verse 8, and Peter answered, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord. Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came and found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So a couple things. Sapphire knew the truth. She knew the truth, and yet she lied. Uh, Peter said that she had agreed together to test the Holy Spirit, to test the Spirit of the Lord, and that she was held accountable for her actions. She was held accountable for her actions. Um, remember, in this time, that girls were property of their fathers; wives were property of their husbands. There was no authority given to women whatsoever in any sense. Um, so let's, let's jump into verse 11. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. Notice they added that, that in that section, though it's almost identical, came upon all the church. And yes, I'm taking a step in, trying to, trying to t tease it out, but... I think, it's, I think it's fairly safe to say that, th that this opened up some eyes as to what the Lord was doing. And in particular, it opened up some eyes in regards to his, his thoughts towards women, his thoughts towards who, who they are in his church, his thoughts towards, think about God does not give accountability outside of giving some authority, right? So he placed on her, in, in, in this mindset, put yourself in this first century mindset, Women are not used to having any accountability. They just do what your husband does. And as long as you do what your husband does, you're not going to get in trouble. So, but, but she was taken. Peter 
came to her, asked her, she gave her words, and then was held accountable for not telling the truth. And so I think it's a, that the fear that came upon all the church may have been the realization of women that I'm now accountable for my own actions. I'm now accountable to stand and, and tell the truth, period. And for men to say, ooh, my wife now has a mantle of authority to not just do what I tell her to do, but to tell the truth, to speak the truth, to, to confront truth. Um, so let's hit a life, life lesson here. God does not give accountability without authority, nor authority without accountability. A wife has the authority and accountability under God to stand up for truth, even if it opposes her husband. This would have been crazy, crazy thinking in the first century church. Um, in our church, this, in, in, our, in our modern time, this sounds crazy on the, on the other side as though, what? Of course that's true. But this doesn't say wife has authority and accountability under God to stand up for her own flesh against her husband or her own desires or whatever she wants or whatever. It's for the truth. she got to stand. She has the authority to stand up for truth in opposition to her husband. So, going back to the story at large, the, the story of Ananias and Sapphira, uh, again, at a quick glance, seems like a really, really harsh overreaction until you've peeled back the fact that they, that they A, were believers. And like I said, this, this was something that until I began to study the Scripture, it just never dawned on me. Oh yeah, they were included in part of that. And when, they're, when you recognize they're included in part of that, that yeah, they breathed their last that day, but they stepped into the arms of a forgiving, loving Father. And what, what, did, he, what did He spare them from down the, down the road, their heart already was divided. What did he spare them from? A, a further division, a further fa a falling away that he, at that point, took them at, while they were believers. Yes, in sin, but while they were believers. And he took them uh, to be gone. So, so the other thing that, that we take out of this, this particular uh, record is The Bible doesn't just waste words. The Bible doesn't, uh, you know, let's just add additional words, repeat ourselves and whatnot. There's, there's a, when you see something repeated, when you see a phrase repeated, it should jump out at you and say, hmm, why is this repeated? And so we see a phrase in here that is almost identically repeated with the addition of upon the whole church. So great fear came upon all who heard these things. That was after Ananias died. After Sapphira died, so great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. This, this was a message. This was um, a wake-up call. And I'm, I'm not going to pretend I have a, a perfect understanding of this passage at all. But, but as I kept digging through this, I kept, what is this? Is it about lying? Yeah. Is it about hypocrisy? Sort of. Is it about... You know, a divided heart. They gave, they sold A, they uh, kept back some. Is it about a divider? I, maybe there's a little bit of all, of all of that in there. If you go back to 2 Timothy, you know, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. Yeah, all, all of those. No, you shouldn't lie. Uh, no, yes, you should give yourself fully to the God. Um, no, you should, we should not walk around with a mask and hypo hypocrisy acting one way uh, so that we have the accolades of, of people. Absolutely we shouldn't. But, but I think the point of this story, uh, the point of this um, narrative here is that God is drawing our eyes back to Him. There's all this lovey-dovey stuff going on in the church, much grace, giving to each other. Oh, we're so good and happy. And I think He's drawing His eyes up, drawing our eyes up drawing their eyes up into who He is. He is a God full of grace, God full of love with abounding mercy, and yet He's God. He's mighty and holy and just, and He's not just our buddy pal to be trifled with. And so this is a key point in the very early church. Well, he, He's making a mark. Guys, I'm, 
Yes, I love you. Yes, I've offered my son for you. Yes, I'll have mercy and grace. But I'm God, and I'm holy, and I'm just, and I'm set apart. And don't, I'm not to be trifled with. Does that make sense? Verse 12 and 16, 12 through 16, excuse me. And though the hands of the apostles, excuse me, and through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. I've got to avoid the, the Honda joke. I just, sorry. <laughs> Must say the Honda joke. <laughs> All right, they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And the believers were increased, were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on the beds and couches. And at least the shadow of Peter passing, excuse me, I didn't read that well, that at least the shadow of Peter passing might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by clean spirits. And they were all healed. There was an amazing work going on in the early church with the apostles, something that we, um, we see parts of now with, with, with people coming to the Lord. But with the, with the outright, consistent healing is going on. We don't see that a lot, but there was an amazing thing going on. And, and the people around them esteemed them highly. They thought so much so that they would bring people to set them on steps that, that they knew Peter would walk by just hoping, just hoping that a shadow would fall on them. They thought they had exalted Peter up to a point where, man, this guy is amazing. So they esteem the apostles. They esteem the Christians very highly. And yet they didn't join them. And notice they did not join them. And so my point being is that God didn't call us to be esteemed. He didn't call us to be esteemed highly by men. We should, as, as seeking after being, being a, um, the, the idea of an elder is is. Yes, we should have a good report among men. However, we should not be, be, be desiring just for people to esteem us highly. That's not the goal, right? We should, uh, Luke 26, excuse me, 626. Woe to you and all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. And John 1243, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. And, and I'm not saying at all that the apostles thought this way, but it's very easy. And I, I work in the business world. It's very easy for me to fall into the, hey, everybody loves Joel. Hey, I'm, I've got a good, good, everybody likes me at work. But am I really affecting them for the kingdom? And I, am I really uh, able to share Christ with them? Or do they just esteem me highly? Because if they just esteem me highly, that may give me a platform to offer Christ to them. But esteeming me highly is not going to save them. So if I walk away from there and they esteem me highly and they never heard the gospel, what have I done? I haven't done my job. I haven't done what God put me in that place for, right? And so it is... We see in this time that there are many multitudes of both men and women coming to the Lord, coming to the Lord, not coming to those who they esteemed highly. They're coming to the Lord. Because why, though? Because they're preaching the gospel. They're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're sharing what, what God did through his son. Um, you've probably heard the, the quote that's attributed to, um, to Francis of Assisi, Preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. So spiritual. It's, yeah, yes, we, we should live a life that reflects what we believe. Absolutely. But again, if people just esteem you highly, they're not going to be drawn to Christ. That may give you a platform to share Christ with them, but they're not going to, they're not going to become the Christ. We must use our mouths. God's called us to preach the gospel. He's called us to share with people. 
life lesson. Men might esteem you highly, but someone must preach the gospel to them for them to be saved. Let that someone be you. And I work, like I said, I work in the business world, and um, most, many of you do, I think all of you do here. So that, that, that's an interesting thing to deal with. How do, how do we walk in the business world, not wasting my boss's time, being a blessing to the establishment that I work for, and yet being a missionary to the organization? That's, I'm not going to lie, that's hard. That's, that's difficult to work out. But that's what we're there for. We should, our work is not just to put a house over, a roof over our head and food on the table. Our work is where God has planted us to be missionaries. Men might esteem you highly, but someone must preach the gospel to them for them to be saved. Let that someone be you. So I'm going to wrap up here. Um, John, I already did 43, but John 12, 24 through 43. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. You're men. You are men. God has called you to be a ruler. To ruler of at least yourself. To ruler of your home. Um, and so who are, the, who are those you're afraid of in your life? Who are those that, that keep you from confessing him? That keep you from um, exalting Jesus? Are there those? That's good. That's good. But are there those for some of you? And so recognize that when, when, you, when you get to that point or when you get to that, man, this person, potentially my wife, this whatever, they, I have a hard time speaking truth with them. I have a hard time confessing Christ with them. Recognize that and, and, and notice that you're, that you're fearing man versus fearing the Lord. And finally, Matthew 23, 12, and whoever exalts himself must be humbled, and he who humbles himself, excuse me, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Um, if we seek to exalt ourselves, if we seek to get praise uh, from men, if we seek to, to, to have other gifts, have other things that other ha others have, because those look cool and we're not instead living the life that God has given us, we will be humbled. We, we, we must humble ourselves, walk thankfully in the gifts that God has given us. He may give us more gifts. He may give us more. When we're faithful in the little things, when we're faithful in walking out the, the, the little things in life, the Bible tells us He will give us more. But we can't look over there and wish I had that and, and be faithful in the little things. We must first be faithful in the little things. He, who, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, God, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for um, the record you've given us, God, of um, Hananiah and, and Sapphira. And um, God, that they chose a lesser thing. Uh, rather than walk in what you gave them, they, they chose a lesser thing. Um, my God, I thank you, Lord, uh, for your grace even in their life. And I thank you, Lord, for your, the grace in our lives, Lord, that um, how often do we sing, I surrender all, and, and yet we're bringing just a portion and holding back the rest. God, how, how often is that really what our heart says? God, forgive us uh, for not truly bringing all. Lord, forgive us for not, uh, Lord, exalting you and your son Jesus in our hearts and minds and lives, Lord, when we don't. And just pray, God, that you uh, continue reminding us, as you have in this scripture, God, that, uh, that you are God and you are holy and you are just. Uh, yes, who 
has offered mercy, who's offered grace. But help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, I thank you for these men. Lord, I thank you for this time. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm sure they're going to cut that part off of the uh, what they put online, I imagine. But <laughs> Happy birthday to you, Joel. <laughs> Say happy birthday. <laughs> Mr. Carson. Thank you, sir. I'm sure they're going to cut that part off of the uh, what they put online, I imagine, but. <laughs> <laughs>